Hey there again, how's it going? We're gonna do a bit of a Hollywood thing today. Oh, shit. The sleeves. There we go. Now I feel ostentatious enough to talk about this. So hey folks, how's it going? Enjoyed doing that little news roundup thing last Friday. Gonna make a regular thing out of it. But I figured at the same time, I, I shouldn't leave it limited to political or cringe news. Why not tackle Hollywood too? After all, it's something that's near and dear to all of our hearts, especially because it's the only place in which we can see adequate reflections of ourselves portrayed in a way that seems cooler than we actually are. Wait. So, to begin, we've got a story you probably heard about. This is all from last week, so we're sort of doing a roundup wrap-up thing. But, um, well, it, uh, we're going to start it off with Scarlett Johansson. That's right, Scarlett Jo became the center of a social media firestorm with bloggers from left and left, getting really upset about the fact that she was cast in the role, lead role, of an upcoming film called Rub and Tug, where she was going to portray Dante Tex Gill, a trans man from the 1970s, if memory serves, um, who was something of a notorious hustler. Now, Gill, in his time, um, ran a massage parlor brothel sort of deal. Quite the hustler, quite the pimp, as you can kind of see from the from the image there. But all the same, Joe Hansen was uh, tagged and cast and, uh, and hired on for the lead role playing Gil in what I imagine would be something of a biopic outlining what went down. And of course, because this cisgendered straight woman was cast as a trans man in a film, well, I mean, literal busloads of trans people were just murdered in the streets upon the hearing of this. But all in all, it's sarcasm aside, um, this is yet another instance of uh, pointless, feckless outrage, in my humble opinion, and one which we were all really treated to, especially if you're on Twitter over the course of the last week, especially when the beginning of the old firestorm itself was at least initially announced. Now, this all took place when the announcement came out and a series of progressive bloggers and social media culture critics, always a solid reputation with those types, um, came out just bashing saying that this is another instance of trans erasure, that this is a role which should have gone to a transgender actor, but it was basically stolen by a cisgendered straight woman. And to that, I really had two primary questions. One being, which is more uh, productive in terms of telling a trans story, especially one about something of a notorious character like Gil, which would have likely humanized the living hell out of, uh, out of something of an absolute hustler. But which would have been more effective here? Uh, to have an A-list actor with a big box office draw, arguably perhaps one of the hottest uh, talents, uh, hottest properties in Hollywood at the moment, uh, portraying this, humanizing this character, and bringing this story of a transgender man to a broad audience using her box office appeal to put asses and seats and eyeballs on screens? Or would it be better for this to be something of an art house flop, the kind of thing that maybe gets small amounts of tractions when certain bloggers give it glowing reviews because of its wokeness and progress? aggressive ideology um, after a transgender actor who may be relatively unknown was cast. Now, it was funny because in the course of the discussions and the debates and the arguments, which exploded mainly on Twitter, I found that very, very few people had any actual filmmaking sort of uh, criticisms to offer about this story and almost universally sort of reverted to the notions of representation on screen as though that is somehow the most empowering aspect of telling a story about a person who is not who they are portraying. Now, in this, it's rather easy for a lot of people to forget that actors are not actually the characters that they're playing, but all the same, it didn't stop a bunch of people from getting really upset. Now, the funny part came when I asked the secondary question. For most of the people who would screech and scream about how this should have gone to a trans actor, that transgender roles belong to transgender people, and there is no excuse for not doing that, blah, blah, blah. My question was typically, who would you cast in this role? And to that question, I was typically given absolutely no real concrete answers. Uh, the closest being, well, they're, I'm sure they're out there. We just don't know because Hollywood is so against casting trans folks in these roles. Now, to this, I actually do have an idea and a suggestion. It's one that I really hope that they pick up and run with. And that, of course, is Leah Delaria. Now, you might recognize Leah here as uh, from her roles on Orange is the New Black, where she plays a very butch badass 
hustler character. And if we compare these photos here, well, that's kind of curious, kind of almost a little on the nose in terms of the, the overall look and presentation of what it seems that we get from this, and at least from this photo, as to what Gil was like. Now, to my mind, I would actually think that in this case, Delario would probably be a better casting choice than Joe Hansen, but at the same time, with the relatively limited scope of Delario's star as it is right now, with the most prominent role being that in Orange is the New Black, Orange is the New Black, which in, by the way, she... Absolutely kills it. I, even though that show is so heavenly laden with very sloppy, very obvious, progressive, feminist messaging, um, it's all the same. Still a great show, and Delaria absolutely kills it. Now, whereas the casting choice makes more sense in many respects, this question does still come back to, does this character, does this actor, rather, have the kind of draw required to bring new audiences into a film about a transgender person, people who may even have some kind of, well, maybe funny or or anti-trans ideas in their head, which could, in a sense, be sort of ameliorated in some respect by the portrayal of a trans character in a way that they can enjoy and identify with. Now, from my position, I would say that the casting of an A-lister in this actually does more to advance the causes of trans acceptance than it would be simply to cast a trans actor simply because they are trans. If for nothing else, too, then that is something of a pandering and tokeneering sort of move on the part of a studio who might actually seek to exploit the sort of outrage which is exploding left and left over uh, over the nature of you know trans acceptance in society uh, it really would have been a lot better i think to have a major box office draw now i know everyone wants to get everything done all at once but every so often i think it's important for people to take a step back and realize that if you want to get from a to z in terms of societal progress sometimes you have to walk across the rest of the letters before you can get there but all the same this is a question i'm actually kind of eager to hear your takes on what do you think would have been better for them to actually find a transgender actor to portray this character, potentially sacrificing market share in the process of doing such, but in a sense maybe being more true to the story? Or was Joe Hansen perhaps a good pick because of her box office draw? Also, given that photo there, tell me honestly, do you think anyone would fit this role in Hollywood better than Leah Delaria? Well, I'm saying I'm looking forward to hearing your comments on that one. And with that, we're going to move on to our next topic. So on to our next topic. For this one, we actually come to a, uh, an instance in which uh, it's Dwayne The Rock Johnson who's actually caught a little bit of attention. Now, before we get into this story, I want to clarify at the, at the top of this that uh, though I find the diversity and inclus inclusion, inclusivity narratives that seem to be strewn around every discussion about popular culture and media in general to oftentimes be really cringy, every so often I do find that there is a certain level of uh, validity to them that maybe is oftentimes overshadowed by the eagerness and overzealousness on the part of those who want to make the most just and equitable society possible by whatever means possible, uh, that they sort of gloss over some of the more finer nuances of the thing. But we're going to jump into this story here, and it's around The Rock in his new film, Skyscraper. The Pearl is the tallest, most advanced building in the world. You've built a vertical city but you brought with it every single safety and security challenge that I could think of. We thought this floor was empty. So did I. If we're gonna get out of here, you're gonna have to tell me the truth. There's a reason they chose this building. Now, I, for one, am not particularly excited for this, as it looks sort of like a rather generic sort of action-adventure starring The Rock, uh, in which he plays a security contractor who has to save a bunch of lives or something, you know, burning skyscraper. There'll be plenty of dangling from uh, open windows and, and, and great astonishing heights. And undoubtedly, a portion in the movie in which uh, the character's amputated leg comes into uh, play in some major way. Now, all the talk about the movie aside, as we can see, I mean, there's not a whole lot to get, at least in my opinion, altogether excited about when it comes to this film. It doesn't look like anything more than generic action schlock, and that's something that summer audiences really do enjoy. However, following this and following playing an amputee, a disabled person with a missing leg, The Rock is actually now taken to becoming something of a disabilities advocate, saying that uh, society in general, and specifically Hollywood, needs to open up more on opportunities, more doors to disabled people, um, saying that uh, Hollywood really needs to just basically step it up and start casting more disabled actors in roles in major feature films. Now, to this, I am kind of forced to scratch my head, as in the article listed here, he does actually sort of praised for standing up and speaking on the behalf of the whole 
disabil- uh, disabilities or disabled community, to which I'm, again, sort of forced to ask myself, what is the defining characteristic of this community? Is it one in which that some, anybody who is anything short of able-bodied qualifies as disabled and is therefore part of the community? Could we say that the sheer numbers of actors with a very obvious personality, emotional and mental instability and mental issues and mental health issues themselves qualify as disabled being cast on the regular? Or is it only for things of a more obvious sort of nature? Are we talking about developmental disabilities? Are we talking about amputees, people with lost limbs, people with medical conditions? I don't know. Now, all the same in this, he plays a man, uh, an amputee, missing a leg. And with this, I couldn't help but wonder that if uh, the same sort of question was raised around The Rock playing uh, an amputee and a disabled individual that was raised around Scarlett Johansson playing a transgender man, wouldn't it have been better to give the role to somebody who was actually missing a leg? And if that was the case, would the casting be centered on the missing leg, or would it be centered on the box office draw, which is clearly why they got The Rock in the first place? Now, personally, I am all for real honest diversity and inclusion um, sorts of efforts, as long as they're done well when it comes to the nature of art and film. If we look back to the, I believe it was an ABC network TV series, Kingdom Hospital, this was something in which, uh, oh, they were basically just trying to cash in on the name of Stephen King, who ostensibly created the series and I believe wrote some of it. You can kind of get a few whiffs of that cocaine vibe uh, in some of the storytelling that goes on. But within that show, within that story, there was actually a pair of disabled actors who played, I believe they were a twin brother and sister, a pair of sort of orderlies who lurked around the hospital and were curiously seeming to be the only people in the hospital who knew anything that was going on. Now, if you haven't checked out the show, go give it a watch. It's actually pretty entertaining and it should be available for streaming somewhere around. But all the same, these two actors, they, I believe, had Down syndrome. They were very, you know, obviously um, developmentally disabled. Yet in the same token, that really didn't factor in all that much to the characters that they were playing. Those same characters could have been played by perfectly abled people otherwise, but I actually do think to a certain extent because of the sort of innocent charm that their disability brought to the at least aesthetic of the character, which masked what was obviously a deeper understanding of some really twisted plot points going on, it really actually added a lot of sort of spooky kind of gravitas to them and their scenes. Now all the same though, I have to wonder if in the course of our efforts to strive for a more just and inclusive and equitable society if maybe we're not altogether rushing headlong into something in which anybody who is anything short of the perfect able-bodied cis white capitalist person, I don't know, if they're going to start be given jobs on, as a matter of sort of tokenism so that the studios and perhaps even whatever limited audiences go out to see them on those bases can demonstrate in a virtue signal just how woke they really are. Are we barreling towards a time in which we're going to be recreating things from the early to mid-90s in which every cast required that they have at least one disabled person in a wheelchair? Maybe we'll call them wheels. Yeah! Or are we going to find this shit sort of dropping by the wayside and finding ourselves maybe, maybe moving towards a place in which we well, maybe value performances based on the skills and draws of the performer rather than the token aspects of their personality or demographic? I don't know. We're, I mean, is it going to get worse or is it going to get better? I leave that question to you. Now for the final story, we've got something just as fun. So for this final story, just to make sure that we didn't spend all of our time bashing those crazy lefties and their uh, crusades and campaigns to make the world just and equal, well, we're going to actually look to Sasha Baron Cohen. That's right, everybody's favorite, uh, well, IRL film troll, as a sense. This Borat slash Bruno slash the dictator himself is back at it again, this time on Showtime. Now, as usual, Philly D totally beat me to this story, so I'm going to leave out uh, sort of the details that he went into, and if you really want to get more on that, feel free to go over, check out his video as well. But for my part, what I found really funny about this was that we found, once again, Again, that, that that old horseshoe theorem that everybody hates to talk about seems to be in full effect once more. This, of course, being because in his new show, Who is America?, Cohen actually made his way in very heavy disguise in a multitude of characters so rich and thick that you would think that perhaps he'd single-handedly produce Bad Grandpa at some point, trolling the living shit out of conservative to commentators and political people, and doing everything from hosting events where he was encouraging... Uh, Uh, guns to be given to kindergartners uh, and getting a number of prominent conservative Republicans to agree with it as well as sort of just... (laughs) 
you got to wonder what the fuck these people are thinking when they get involved in something like this. Um, all the way up through Sarah Palin. Now, Sarah Palin's interview was the one which seemed to grab the most sort of headlines when he posed as a disabled uh, uh, military veteran and uh, held one of his sort of mock interviews where he, he rather cleverly sort of guided and goaded Palin into saying some things she maybe looked stupid saying. I know it's a major change of pace from Palin. We all know her as an absolute genius member of Mensa. I'm pretty sure she's got five PhDs at this point and she never makes a gaffe. But all the same, here she was uh, coming out into the media, being, being rather offended at the whole notion of saying, who do you think you are? Um, this was actually followed up by another one of his targets, Joe Walsh, who if you're on, uh, if you're on Twitter enough and you, and you look at like the right wing Twitter sphere close enough, you'll find Joe Walsh popping up over and over and over again. He's a former House rep turned uh, conservative radio commentator. And uh, after admitting that he was duped by Cohen, actually uh, stepped out and uh, began openly calling for a boycott of the show. Now, if you're wondering why I brought this up, in addition to the fact that it's hilarious to see people of these profiles getting trolled in such such thorough and brilliant ways as Cohen is able to offer us, it is a funny thing, too, when you consider that dreaded horseshoe theory and how it consistently sort of proves to be right. Now, in general, when we hear about a bunch of people upset on political grounds, uh, calling for a boycott of a given film or piece of art or piece of fiction or even piece of music, uh, we typically, and rightly, usually universally start to think of it as a sort of left-wing thing. The same sorts of people who are upset about Scarlett Johansson playing a trans man are typically also the ones who call for boycotts because things aren't inclusive enough or because they think that it glorifies something they don't like or otherwise just offends their delicate sensibilities. Well, here we get a really great example of how the right wing, in this case Joe Walsh and co, are perfectly capable of emulating that same behavior to a he. Here he is calling for a boycott of Baron Cohen's uh, works and um, openly on Twitter admitting to the fact that he was openly duped. Sarah Palin is up in arms and naturally decent swaths of the American right wing are sort of expressing some form of outraged sympathy with these people as they go forward. But what do you think? I mean, is there, are we approaching a time in this sense in which it's going to become genuinely uh, difficult to distinguish between left wing and out right wing outrage if you take the words out. It kind of reminds me of that old game, Tumblr or Stormfront, in which certain keywords are removed from given phrases and makes it utterly impossible to determine whether or not we're talking about third wave social justice feminists or neo-fucking Nazis. But all the same, I really want to see if this is something going forward. And if, and if you're ever so interested, feel free to take snippets out of things like Vox or like the American Conservative, whatever the fuck kind of magazine you can find, and see if you can turn one of these right or left wing uh, sort of ad lib, mad lib questions um, to, to your own following. Ask them, is this, you know, take out the keywords instead of liberal or conservative or gay or straight or whatever it might be. Remove those words and let's see if people can really get a solid bead on whether or not the outrage is pouring from left or right, if for nothing else, so that we can finally put the matter to bed and agree once and for all that the imbecilic fringe wings that seem to flap their, you know, flap their uh, hands as they faint upon a couch somewhere over some horrendous this outrage and injustice done to their ideology, and just to, just to prove to the public how very similar they really are, especially when it comes to such an easy punching bag as entertainment, something everybody loves, something people can't get enough of, and something which is apparently now tasked with representing the truest ideals of given ideologues and philosophies rather than just being entertaining films. So this has been your fit to spin. That's all the Hollywood news that's fit to spin. See, I'm kind of developing this here. I thank you all for coming back around. I hope you're enjoying this sort of new format. There will be more of the old style videos coming out as well, as well as uh, more of these sorts of things, topical things, things about things going on in the world because they don't stop all because I try to ignore them, apparently. But I appreciate you coming back around. If you haven't already, leave a like on this video. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't. The numbers are kind of starting to waver. It's almost like my channel might not die. That would be fantastic. And if you don't want the channel to die and you don't want me to starve to death, of course, there's links down below for ways you can support this channel and the work I do. Things such as Patreon, uh, PayPal, Maker Support, and all that. Additionally, you can always catch me over at the YouTube Saints every Sunday night at 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific Time. And then on that other streaming site, 
Street that we're not allowed to mention on YouTube anymore, apparently. Every Sunday, every Thursday night, rather, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Western, Jeff Holliday and I uh, try to try to sort of act as internet oncologists, diagnosing the cancer we find around the web and having a good fun time and maybe a few beers in the process. That all being the case, though, thank you once again for stopping by, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Kindly get out of here so I can shut these lights off. They are fucking killing me in this summer heat. <laughs>